Hi guys, Dane here, and as part of the latest installment in Tard and Dane's Indie Read Along, I'm going to be looking at the Golden One trilogy by Hans M. Hershey. So Hans is an indie author friend of mine. He actually sent all three of these books to me. He asked me if I wanted to review the late his latest book, which was the third book in the trilogy, and I asked if he could send the first one because I haven't read that. And he ended up sending all three, which is very kind of him. Uh, as I say, I've read some of his stuff before, really enjoyed it. They've usually got sort of LGBTQIA plus themes in them, and these are no different. And these are YA fantasy, so I'm going to start today by giving you the, my review of The Golden One Blooming, which is book number one. So, here's the blurb. Earth is threatened by humankind. A long time ago, in an effort to help protect her creation, Mother Nature created the Ahana, a worldwide league of shapeshifters, to restore and maintain the natural balance. During particularly troublesome times, she deployed her ultimate defense, a delicate yet powerful golden butterfly to change the odds in nature's favor. Blooming is the first book in the trilogy about Jason Mendez, a 17-year-old living a normal teenage life in a small town in the American Midwest. One day, Jason's world is turned upside down when he realises the dream he had the night before was in fact reality, and that he was flying through a nearby meadow. Jason is the golden one, called upon to avert a major crisis threatening Earth. With no golden butterfly sighted since the final days of World War II, will Jason be able to walk in his predecessor's shoes? Will he be able to replicate their historic achievements and save the planet from all but certain disaster? And what exactly is threatening Mother Nature to call upon the Golden One? The Golden One is an exciting new fantasy trilogy dealing with urgent topics affecting humanity today. I don't know, I'll agree with that. It deals very much with the environment, things like fracking in this, conservationism. And to that extent, it reminded me actually of some of the books that Lawrence St. John has written, although she's more of a middle grade author. And yeah, for an indie book, really well put together, very well. You can tell it's been professionally edited, but all the designer stuff is done as well very nicely. It's from Beat and Track Publishing. And yeah, Hans is like, he's a pro, man. He's published probably a dozen books or so by now, and all the ones I've read have been very good. But anyway, let's go through and uh, start looking at some of my tags. So this is kind of an example of a lot of the humour that's throughout this. I mean, I'm probably too old really to be read like, or, well, I don't know. You're never too old to read YA, but you know what I mean. I'm I'm older than the target audience, and maybe that doesn't work so well with the humour all the times. So, for example, we have this conversation. Did you drug me? Hannah laughed. No, I most certainly did not. Look, I can understand this is a shock for you, but you are a Beyonce too. I noticed your aura this morning in school. I haven't seen one in school before, not this strong. We usually bloom during puberty, and we are guided by our parents. They're usually the first ones to see the aura after we bloom. There are a few others in our school. Bloom? Suddenly I blushed. Did she know what I'd done last night in bed? No, I don't. Or I didn't until now, and ew. Hannah's face became distorted. Would you mind, please? Because uh, she's got uh, psychic sort of mind-reading powers. So the Beyoncé, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong... Are this uh, other other creatures, and then uh, the Ohana is like the secret organization. And um, what's his name? Jason says, "Seems to me you guys are losing the battle. All I had to think of was climate change or all the wars we were fighting. Humanity was wreaking havoc on the Earth, even on a small scale. Right here in Amberville, there were plans to drill for natural gas. Grandpa was always against that." He said it would upset the earth. So uh, we hear about this. This is the story of the golden butterfly during the war. So the last time we saw a golden butterfly was on the 15th of August 1945 at the tail end of World War II when the weaponeer of the third bomb destined for Tokyo found a golden butterfly on his release switch. Moved by the sight of the butterfly, he found himself unable to drop the bomb. Hours later, upon landing on their base, the news reached them that the Tenno had surrendered to the Allied forces. The bomb had indeed not been necessary, as Beyoncé had worked tirelessly around the clock after Nagasaki to end the war without further contaminating Mother. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives, were saved that day, human and animal alike. But there's also part of the legend that says like the, the golden one never makes it back. When, uh, when this kid's the butterfly as well, Hans used this great word, um, papillinoidian. Uh, he says, I wasn't lost though because I began to pick up other sensory information from my antennae and my proboscis, including certain smells that, as odd as they seem to my papillinoidian senses, I did recognise vaguely from my human experience. The smell of sewage and trash coming from town. And that would just mean butterfly-like because papillon is French for butterfly. We get this nice geeky reference here which I'm going to read out. I landed on a nearby flower pod on the alfalfa plant and calmed my wings, folding them above my body like the wings of an imperial shuttle in Star Wars. 
forgive the comparison, but it made me feel more cool about myself and a little less fragile given the situation. And to be fair, uh, he is in his uh, butterfly form talking to a cat, so he knows he could get, you know, squished. I like this quote from a character called Laurel. She says, I can almost see that happen. We are a fairly arrogant species, and we've been very good at building dogma around our own superiority. Just look at the Bible. Amen, brother. And then basically the thrust of the, the end of this story is that um, this company's coming to do some fracking, and they're trying to, trying to stop it, but in like they're trying to move the fracking site to a different place, basically, because the town also kind of needs the money for the economy, which I thought was interesting. It showed both sides, but it did, again, it kind of focused a lot on the, the negatives of fracking, which is a good thing because fracking is bad. So actually an example of that and also, I don't know, I guess, I think it's kind of interesting it's included here. So, um, so they're talking about like the groundwater table and someone says, now imagine an earthquake and the dam being ruptured or damaged. Even if that isn't very likely as these things are built to last, it cannot be ruled out with certainty. The much greater threat is posed by the wastewater tanks and the fracking liquid tanks. Imagine if they rupture. There are so many chemicals used, and while we don't know exactly what oil co is using because of every company's trade secrets, benzene is apparently widely used. Is that some sort of alcohol? Dinesh shook his head. No, not really, and I would advise against drinking it. It's just one of the many compounds in natural crude oil, and very toxic. It's highly carcinogenic. Carcin a what? I hadn't heard that term before. Carcinogenic, meaning it causes cancer, which is why it's not used outside industrial applications. Imagine this stuff leaking into our water table, leaking into the reservoir, leaking period. And it's very common in fracking. Well, we also have these kids, they re reportedly hack oil co servers. I think it's like three times. And while I, I kind of get it, I mean, it's YA, so it's sort of dumbed down in a way and whatnot. And like it is explained that oil co uses very little security or whatever, but that's just strange to me. <laughs> you need to be good. I don't think most people realise how much shit you need to know to be a hacker. And then there's a death with one of the animals, which I don't even want to talk about because it was awful. But yeah, all in all, I did enjoy reading this one. I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5. I thought it was a pretty good start to the series. And uh, yeah, there's lots of stuff in it to make you think and that kept pushing me on towards the next one. So, speaking of the next one, because I have made a start so we can start this review. Uh, we have The Golden One Deceit, which is book 2. So, I'll read you the blurb here. The global Ohana is planning for the transition of power, and its head, Dawa Abraham, is anxious to meet the Golden One. Shortly after, Jason begins to experience strange dreams. All the while, he and his four friends are trying to figure out why Mother sent the Golden One to Amberville. Powerful enemies lurk in the shadows, ready to make Jason's existence a living hell. Don't miss the continuation of the thrilling fantasy trilogy about 17-year-old Jason Mendez, aka the Golden One, as he navigates the shoals of deception and the people supposedly close to him. The Golden One is an exciting new fantasy trilogy dealing with urgent topics affecting humanity today. And what I think is cool about this one is this kind of builds on the last one. So in the last one, they're fighting against like this outside enemy. And in this one, we start to realise that the Ohana themselves might not be fully trustable. And we have a character called Dinesh. He comes out and actually it's kind of uh, contrasted with Jason because Jason is gay as well. And he's came out to his mother, but not to his friends. And so Dinesh does this really brave thing of coming out and he's like tormented inside of like, should I say something? Should I join in? You know? And then Dinesh says, have you looked around, Jason? His voice was hard and laden with pain. It's not like there's an abundance of gay kids here in Amberville. We don't have a straight and gay alliance in school. Sorry, we don't even have a straight and gay alliance in school. We didn't have one of those at my school. In fact, I've never heard of a straight and gay alliance, but I can kind of guess from the context what is involved. And then uh, we learn that Mr. Salieri, who's one of her friend's grandparents, might be responsible for the death of her own grandparent for various reasons. There's a bit of a conspiracy going on. So basically, uh, when, when the grandparent was driving along, Mr. Salieri changed into his elk forms and then split seconds before the car's headlights were detected him. Your father was a good man and would have never hurt any animal, so he steered the car away while Mr. Sal Salieri stood perfectly still. Unfortunately for your father, he swerved to the right rather than the left and hit a tree. He was killed instantly and didn't suffer. So yeah, there, there is this big old conspiracy going on and Jason decides to start to unravel it. And kind of the reason that the Golden One isn't always accepted, so it says here, um, you know, people in Amberville didn't believe those stories either. You see the Golden One as a symbol of the efforts of the collective, a metaphor for our triumphs throughout victory. You see the Golden One as a symbol of the efforts of the collective, a metaphor for our triumphs throughout history. Now, try to picture these people suddenly faced with the actual physical presence of a golden butterfly, seeing the Golden One with their own eyes in their own town. It's earth-shattering. Worse still, 
if this most important Beyonce of all, this symbolic leader of all of us, suddenly takes on the shape of a 17-year-old kid from your local high school who is the grandson of your predecessor, your former rival to power in Amberville, can you see how my mother would feel in the light of all this? And it's said that um, Beyonce aren't like vulnerable to like things like lying and cheating and all that kind of things, but they are also human. So the human part of it means that they are vulnerable to it, if that makes sense. There we go. I'm going to read this. This kind of covers that a bit more. Oh, honey, you're a Salieri. Don't you know your own history? Your family has been here for generations. Your ancestors were part of the Push West. You drove my people and other tribes from our ancestral lands. You locked us up on those reservations of yours, like animals in a zoo. Free to roam, but prisoners nonetheless. Do you really think Mother wanted this for her American peoples? To be hunted, killed by the thousands, ravaged and decimated by diseases? Do you really believe she wanted her own protectors, the Beyoncé, to sit idly by as one tribe after another was led to the brink of extinction? The bison, who once roamed this land by the tens of thousands, were hunted and killed. The wild mustangs all but disappeared. And what did the Beyoncé do to stop it? Nothing. They didn't even make an exception of the native Beyoncé. They saw the halo and still pulled the trigger. We were quickly overpowered and outnumbered. The same racial prejudice that plagues the white man also plagues the Beyoncé. Here we just get a little throwaway reference to there being almost 50 million Beyoncé on the planet, but I think that's quite cool little added info, you know? So it's in this book that we learn Jason can actually take on other animal forms as well. He's not limited to the golden butterfly, or that's, I guess, I, I guess that's his, like, core form, you know? She also learns that she can cure people as well with her tears, and um, it's kind of sad because, obviously, she saved, uh, she saves Mika, who is her, her cat with this, but um, she, the badger, I think it was a badger, there was some animal died at the end of the first one, and she realises that if she'd known about her gift, she could have saved this animal, you know? In fact, we have a conversation here. Too bad you didn't cry when Naish died. I did. I just think it was too late. He was already dead. When he was first wounded, I was in some sort of autopilot mode. I just acted, you know. And when I finally let myself go, when we buried him that night, it was too late. I'm also not sure if any of my tears ever touched him. You got lucky, my friend. I thought this was interesting as well. So the Beyoncé inviting kind of dignitaries from all around the world. And... Um, yeah, there's this kind of this little paragraph here about some of the uh, the um, kind of the attitudes they hold towards foreigners. We weren't quite successful with all our Beyoncé families. There was a considerable amount of fear of the unknown, of strangers, particularly foreigners in Amberville. That saddened me, given that we, the Beyoncé, was a small community, a minority ourselves. Why couldn't people see past their small-minded preconceptions? And then he's having a conversation with the person that his family hosts, who is, uh, I think, a Japanese woman. She's actually like about 30 odd, but apparently she looks quite young. And um, because she's Beyonce and they're, you know, they're getting their heads together and talking about stuff. And, um, and his, his mum knows that he's gay, but for a second she thinks he might not because this happens. Seeing me sitting on the couch, my hands in Amico's, had my mother's eyes light up with that false hope that befalls all parents when their children tell them they're not quite like the rest and then act to the contrary. I looked at her, retracted my hands and gently shook my head. The tiny ember of hope that had been ignited by the scene before her died a swift and cruel death. But she caught herself amazingly quickly. And like it is said in the narrative, you know, that she's quite old fashioned. She was from a previous generation, you know, where I guess they weren't quite as enlightened as we are today. I say enlightened. We're not very enlightened as a species. So um, Jason gets called upon to make a speech and it's to, I, I believe, to humans and animals, just basically to everyone. And he begins it with uh, gentle beings, which I think is really nice. And then the kid's like, uh, I can always get that information later. I can hack into the phone company's records. Because this kid's a master hacker for some reason. One of Jason's friends. But yeah, I thought this was pretty good all in all. It took the stakes from the first book and raised them a little bit. Ended up on this cliffhanger as well. And uh, I'm just lucky that I had all three books so I could go straight into the, th the third book, you know, without having to wait too long. Overall, I think this was probably a bit, bit better than the first book, but I still gave it a 3.5 out of 5. Very, you know, it was professional, which is this is my default rating for professional books, you know. And uh, yeah, good, good instalment. Definitely didn't suffer from second book syndrome. So that brings us on to the third and final book of the trilogy, which is The Golden One Reckoning. So I will read the blurb. Jason is staying with the ailing Cheyenne elder, Ninavan. Only the most heartbreaking news from Amberville can bring him back to face the biggest trial of his young life. Will Jason be able to fulfil his final mission as the Golden One, a mission from which no Golden One has ever returned? Reckoning is the final instalment of the gripping fantasy trilogy about Jason Mendez, the Golden One, who is called upon to save the world with his four best friends. Will Jason be successful? At what price? Will Earth be safe? 
The Golden One is an exciting fantasy trilogy dealing with urgent topics affecting humanity today. So right from the start, it looks as though I tabbed this one more than the other ones. So we start off right away because Jason's living in the mountains and they're talking about hunting. Uh, I contemplated her request and her suggestion. The idea of killing an animal went against everything I believed in, particularly after all I'd learned these past months. How could I take the life of a creature I could speak to? Ninevan shrugged as I explained. Your choice, of course. But my vegetable supplies won't last forever, you know. And just because you buy your beef at a supermarket doesn't mean you wouldn't have been able to talk to that beef when it was still a cow before it was slaughtered. I know, but still. What if I'm about to sink my teeth into it and it pleads for its life? And I just think that's kind of interesting. I mean, I'm vegan, so, you know, I think about these things. And it's it's always interesting to read about the different ways that these quandaries and, you know, moral and ethical dilemmas are looked at by different people. So later on we get, I noticed how I slowly but gradually shifted my own nutrition towards a more plant-based diet. It was difficult to eat something you could speak to. And actually that reminds me of C.S. Lewis in the Narnia books. He basically said that it was okay to hunt animals because they couldn't speak, but in Narnia, when the animals could speak, you couldn't hunt them. So that was like his definition of what made it morally okay. And it's just interesting to see that crop up here, you know? And then we get this. This is a massive spoiler here, so maybe skip on like 30 seconds if you don't want to hear it, but I thought it was powerfully done. This is about his mother. I could not believe it. She was gone. She had killed herself the night before. Pills. Peter's father had found her when he'd gone over to invite her to her house to celebrate Christmas. Against my wishes, Peter had confided in his father about my disappearance, but without giving him any specific reasons for it, and Mr. Jackson felt very strongly that the Beyonce needed to reach out and look after her. It had been too late. And um, basically in this book, it's almost like a murder mystery of what really happened to his mother, you know? We get this phrase, which I don't know where this came from. But let me read it. So he just said uh, about the funeral stuff, time to put on my big boy panties and get on with things. I'm pretty sure the phrase is big boy pants. And it's American because it means trousers. Because panties would suggest women's underwear. Although you could have big boy panties still, you know. I'm not judging. I thought this bit was quite funny. So Jason's just had a shower and he says, When I stepped out of the stall, Mika was standing by the door looking at me. Hey, would you mind giving me some privacy? As weird as it was to have any animal stare at you naked, to have an animal stare at you that you also spoke to and who talked back was infinitely weirder. Biggie likes to stare at me when I'm naked as well. I don't know if that's TMI, which we'll come back to in a bit. And then so Jason tries to explain the concept of greed to the cat and he says, How can I explain it to you? I wondered aloud, since animals weren't greedy and had no need for the concept. Remember when we first met, out in the field behind the house? Mika looked at me expectantly. You were on the hunt for a mouse, right? After you'd caught the mouse, you were satisfied, am I right? Yes, I ate some grass later to help me digest it, but essentially, yes. Now, had you been a human like Sarah, you would have hunted more mice to take home and store for the future. Or you may have hunted them just for pleasure, maybe to mount the head of the mouse as a trophy to display for your friends, to show them what a mighty hunter you are. You might even have invented a machine to help you hunt the mice. But that's insane! Mika was clearly appalled. Yeah, I guess that's one word for it. You can't store mice for the future. They'll rot and make you sick. I had to laugh at that comment and gathered she hadn't quite understood all of it, but enough to get a sense of what I meant. I like this little reference. So the Ohanas are like the kind of global or there are little organizations all over the globe and then they kind of come together as well. And these, this is the organization that brings together all of these sort of shapeshifters. Sarah considered her words carefully before responding. To paraphrase George Orwell, all Ohanas are equal, but some are more equal than others. Some have shown more business savvy than others and some, by the sheer power of numbers, are more resourceful than others. So yes, some of the local and particularly the regional Lohanas have a certain grasp of what's going on, but most are blissfully unaware, despite owning great fortunes themselves. We have chapter 14 here, and I, I really like this opening of the chapter, especially because this is the kind of thing that keeps me awake as well. Sleep eluded me for the longest time that night. I was preoccupied with my mission, to vanquish the Beyonsim. Was this really the answer? Was humanity ready to assume the mantle? Or was the corruption within the Ohana a small annoyance compared to the havoc humanity wreaked upon Earth? I couldn't even fathom all the crimes we had committed against nature. This was so much bigger than climate change. Our history was full of what ifs, and my mind was racing with all the things I'd read about. Even the smallest transgressions highlighted our cruelty, like the tiny live animals, fish and turtles that the Chinese encased in plastic pouches to sell as keychains, effectively suffocating and starving the animal to death in hours or days at worst. How cruel and cold a heart would even come up with an idea like that. My mind wandered to poachers and big game hunters, hunting and murdering innocent wildlife where just about each and every one of these proud animals was on a list of endangered species, 
What cold-hearted person could ever find joy in killing another being just for fun, for recreation or a trophy? Had humanity no empathy left? And it goes on a little bit more as well. I'm not going to read all of it, but I think that gives you a feel for the, the messages behind this book. And I, I'm all on board, you know? And then James sort of gets the ability to morph from one place to another, or, in, or more specifically, you can... It's still, it's it's kind of interesting actually how Hans developed it within the you know existing rules for the magic system. So basically, Jason can rearrange uh, you know his molecules into different things, and so he just rearranges into air and lets the air currents travel. You, you know, so yeah, the, just that reference to TMI. One of the characters uh, rings one of the other ones, and they say, "I just got out of the shower," and the other one says TMI, and I was like, "Is is that too much information?" I don't, I don't think it is. So this, this bit was quite interesting. He goes to the Mariana Trench. Are you? Was all I heard before I'd vanished. I knew approximately where the Mariana Trench was, off the coast of Guam. And getting there was easy, but to reach the ocean floor wasn't. I had to focus hard, but finally I made it. It was the strangest sensation. Around me there was nothing but absolute darkness. I could sense there was life all around me. Sea creatures that lived down here without ever seeing any sunlight. That they survived was due to food of sorts sinking all the way down here from the surface. Sadly, this also included plastic and other trash. Humanity's impact was palpable even in this remote place. We have this really awkward exchange here where um, Jason goes along um, to to uh, the police headquarters, I guess. I left the restroom and walked up to their reception desk. Good morning, my name is Jason Mendez. Mrs. Winterbourne called ahead. I've come to see my mother, Donna Mendez. Is she being held here at the county jail? The young receptionist looked at me and smiled thinly. No, I replied. She's dead. The coroner is about to release her body for cremation. I just came to take my leave. Oh, the young woman blushed and began to stutter. I'm so very sorry. My bad, my apologies. It's just that... Which is, is an amusing little exchange, but you would think that you would learn that very quickly. In fact, you would think that on day one, they would tell you, like, watch out for this. There's this really touching moment where basically there's a character called Hannah who is friends with Jason, but her mother, Sarah, is kind of his nemesis. And Jason plans to kind of take away everyone's powers and just take away their memories as well. And um, Hannah realises that this means that her mother won't have any memory of all the bad stuff she did. And neither will she. Will she. And so she says, uh, it says, Hannah smiled, but I could see she was in pain too, given the price she'd have to pay for it. Thank you, Jason. Because he's basically given her back her relationship with her mother there, you know. What I also thought was very good was this sort of symbolism. He finally has this uh, funeral service for his mother. And also, he's aware that it's his last day because he has to go and do this thing, basically. He has to go save the world. But no golden one ever comes back from it. And then we get towards the end. And I like the kind of conclusion here. So, for example, Earth's fate was now in the hands of humanity. And never before had those challenges been greater. Maybe that was why Mother had intervened at last. Maybe it was time for humanity to grow up and take responsibility for their actions. Maybe Mother really was the loving parent who had set her offspring free to take the reins of their fate into their own hands. After all, life on Earth would prevail no matter what. The planet's history had proved that life would always find a way. Earth would be okay, at least until the day that our son died. Life would continue to thrive, evolve. But humanity? Humanity's fate was no longer decided by others. And then we get to the ending, and as I say, no golden one ever goes back. Let's put it that way. And uh, we get this bit at the end of the last chapter. I am the golden one, the last of the Beyondsen sent out by Mother to protect Earth. That mission is now humanity's. Take good care of it. It's the only one you have. And I just thought that was a perfect ending. There is also then um, like an, uh, uh, oh, what do you call it, an epilogue uh, where uh, Dinesh is off at university and he meets this young man who turns out to be Courtney. Who So this is like the main character's two love interests come together right at the end, which I thought was quite nice. Overall, I think this was probably the strongest one in the series and I gave it a 3.75 out of 5. There we have it, that's what I made out of the Golden One Trilogy by Hans M. Hershey. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read these books, and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.